All right, can you all hear me okay? Can you all hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Uh, why don't we get started? So um, the exam three average was 63%. Um, if you want to pick up your exams, uh, I'm here today until about three. Um, anyway, I sent you an email regarding, um, you know, my comments on the exam. I think a couple of questions that concerned me especially was, were problem three, which was essentially a homework problem. And it was question three, the one with the bulbs. Um, people struggle with that one too. So anyway, um, when you get your exam, I'm gonna post, I'm, I'm just gonna post the uh, exam key in the glass case outside my office. Um, when you get it, you know, if you have any questions regarding your score or anything, just please feel free to contact me. Fourth exam is on the 19th, okay? So it's gonna come up quick. Um, this is, this, these next few weeks are gonna be busy for us. Um, we, you have a lab due on, the fi on, on Friday, and you have a, a, a scope quiz due on the 10th. The scope quiz should be pretty easy. All you gotta do is demonstrate that you know how to use this device, okay? And there's uh, videos in the modules. Tyler's gonna have a video for you. Um, and even though I'm gonna present the lab on, on uh, Friday, the equipment will be ready for you to play around with, to practice on starting Wednesday. So um, if you wanna come in and practice on the scope ahead of time, please feel free to do that. Um, and then all you have to do is get one of us uh, to test you on the scope. Basically, we're just going to have you go through um, the steps on the last page of the lab. You just got to do it completely on your own. We'll, we'll pick a signal from the signal generator, and you will just going to show, you're just going to demonstrate that you know how to use it. So we have the lab open for you so that you can play around with the equipment so you get familiar with it. Okay, so take advantage of that. It shouldn't really take you that long. And there's no formal report. Once, you, once you're te you've tested, you, you've demonstrated that you know how to use the scope, you get a 20 out of 20 on the lab, okay? And we're gonna, you're gonna need to be able to use the scope for the last two labs of the semester, okay? And, and I, please be aware that uh, we're not the only class doing labs in that room so that um, when Tyler has to take down the equipment, it's gone. So you have to do the lab in that time. You can't come to me and say I had um, something came up or whatever. That's because you waited till the last minute. Get it done early, okay? Um, so yeah, just be aware we're gonna be real busy these next couple of days. From now until uh, probably Thanksgiving, it's gonna be busy, okay? What I plan to talk about today is the um, say a few more things about the motion of charged particles and magnetic fields, basically some applications. I want to talk about the force on the current carrying wire in the magnetic field and the torque on a loop of wire in the magnetic field. I'm probably going to extend the homework deadline about a day because it's due Wednesday. That's a little bit short because uh, we got a little bit behind. Um, just give you some time to work on the homework, but don't, you know, don't wait till the last minute. I, I've noticed too many people waiting till the last minute to start any assignments. And that makes it much harder for you to learn the material. Okay. Um, so last time we talked about the force on the charged particle in the magnetic field. And the force on the charged particle in the magnetic field is governed by this expression. We, it's determined from experiment. This, it involves a cross product, so you're going to have to, uh, we discussed the right-hand rule, so you're going to have to use the right-hand rule. 
And so if you, if you don't remember, go ahead, go through the video again and practice the right hand rule. Um, you will be tested on it on the exam, okay? And realize there's multiple right hand rules in this unit, okay? There's two in this chapter and there's two or three coming up in the next couple chapters. Okay, so you, gotta, you have to know them. But they're all based on what the cross product means. Okay, they're really based on the, what, what a cross product means. Okay. So we talked about the case when uh, if the angle between V and B was 90. So the magnitude of this force, which is both perpendicular to V and B, is from our definition of the cross product given by the following. And theta is the angle between the vector B and the vector, I'm sorry, the vector V and the vector B. Okay, the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector. That's what theta is. And we looked at a case where uh, theta is 90. And we said that this produces circular motion. Okay, so this causes a charged particle to move in a circular path, and that's basically because of this. If the velocity vector has a component of its velocity parallel to the field, the path won't be circular, but it will be a spiral motion. It'll be a helical motion. Okay. If you guys were on campus, I would demonstrate that to you. It's too hard to demonstrate this um, um, online. Okay. Um, and since this produces circular motion, we, uh, that means we have, this is going to produce a centripetal acceleration. And so we said we can write Q V B equals M B squared over R. And we can solve for the radius of the circle the charged particle sweeps out. And I'm going to drop, eventually I'm going to drop the arrows and the, and the Vs. I'm just going to assume that they're magnitudes in a, in a little bit, okay? And we said that this M times V is uh, momentum, and so we can say that the magnetic field is, can be used to select the momentum of charged particles. Okay. So I want to demonstrate this to you because you haven't seen this yet. I didn't get a chance to demonstrate the uh, motion of the electrons. So I'm going to point the camera down and zoom in. All right, so I'm gonna move my table back a little bit. And please let me know if you can't see things. The problem with this room is I can't really turn the light. If I turn the lights off, it's pitch black in here. For you guys, for me, at least I got the computer monitor I can see from okay so I have a, a tube here this is a discharge tube and it has a gas in it I forget what the gas is but it's not at a high pressure and what we're going to do is we're going to shoot electrons in that direction uh, through the gas the speed of the electrons is going to be sufficiently high that it's going to excite the electrons that are in the molecule to a new state, a higher energy state. In other words, you're putting them at the top of a hill. Those electrons don't want to stay at the top of the hill, they want to go back down. And they, and they do so by giving off energy in the form of light. And so the light that you see is going to be indicative of the path of the electrons. Are you able to see the green color? It looks kind of white on my screen, but I can see it. 
Let me turn off the, the lights briefly so you can. You see that green uh, beam? Yeah. Okay, and that, that flat, that the light you see behind it from the from my screen. Okay, I'm gonna turn the lights on. So that's where I'm, um, and, and if I need to do this with the lights off, I'll do it with the lights off, but I'm, I'm trying not to do that. So this is a, uh, just a bar magnet. This is the north pole of the bar magnet. And just to show you, and I gotta be careful when I do this, if I bring the magnets this way, I can't get too close to the electrode, I don't wanna get electrocuted. Okay, really nothing happens to the electron. And if I bring it this way, you might see some motion of the beam. But most of the motion we uh, either towards you or towards us, but the, you won't be able to detect, detect that. What I'm going to do is take this magnet and bring it such that the North Pole points towards you guys. So, V points in that direction. The magnetic field points out of the board. If I use the right hand rule, the right hand rule, point your fingers in the direction of B, curl them towards B, my thumb points downward. However, these are electrons, so I have to flip that vector over. My thumb, I have to flip my thumb over, and I, it's going to say that the force is upward. So that means that when I bring the north pole of the magnet towards this beam, the beam should deflect upward. And it does. Do you see it deflect upward? Maybe let me, let me turn the lights off. Let me try with the lights off. I can, I can kind of see, so. Do you see the beam deflect upward? Yeah. Okay. All right, it's going to get real bright again. i got to turn the lights on. All right. So that verifies, you know, the, the idea, the right-hand rule, etc. cetera. So um, I'm going to turn this off because this thing actually gives off x-rays. So that kind of demonstrates this equation, at least from a conceptual point of view. Okay. Now the full Lorentz force also includes the the force on the charged particle and electric field. And we're going to take a look at that in a little bit. Okay. Can you zoom back out, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're pointing at some stuff off screen. I always forget that. I need, I need my own camera person. Is that blurry? It looks normal. Okay. It might it might just be my eyes. The one side of the board looks a little bit blurry, but okay. All right. Okay. So where was that? Um, So anyway, this this was a like a nice demonstration for you guys, so you could get to see. I have I have I have another one, but it's too hard to, to demonstrate in person uh, uh, online, where I actually have the electron beam go in a circle. You can actually see the circular path. That one's too that one's too difficult to demonstrate on a camera. I think someone has their mic uh, not muted. All right. Um, some applications. Professor, you're frozen. I'm frozen? Okay, hold on a second. Okay. All right, thanks. All right, um, some applications of 
this. One of them is, has to do with the Van Allen belts. And the Van Allen belts has to do with the trapping of charged particles by the Earth's field. The Earth's magnetic field is not a uniform field. Okay, most of the problems we're going to be doing, we're going to assume the field is uniform. Uh, there's a few exceptions. Um, this expression is true whether the field is uniform or not. Okay. But then if the field is not uniform, uh, if you were to derive the expression of the velocity vector in a non-uniform field, it's kind of complicated. Okay, so uh, what are the Van Allen belts? Any, any planet or any celestial body that has a magnetic field actually has a, a set of Van Allen belts. And uh, these are produced by solar winds, and which are basically a stream of charged particles coming from the sun. And these particles uh, come near the Earth. Generally, they enter the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, generally, they come near the Earth, uh, near the poles, if they were to get into the Earth's atmosphere. Those that don't are kind of far away. I mean, they're, they're, they, come in, they come in different bands. There's some that get into the Earth and they, they produce something called the Northern Lights. I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. But there's others that get trapped by the Earth's magnetic field. The heavier ones are the ones that are uh, closer to the Earth. So if you see this figure, hold on a second. The, um, the, the inner belts, that's the purplish color, those are due to protons. Those are due to protons that come from the sun. Okay, these are cosmic rays, and they, um, they reach the Earth, and they get trapped by the Earth's magnetic field. And the, um, on average, uh, the inner belt's about 3,200 kilometers away. It gets as low as 600 miles above the Earth. The outer belt consists of, which is the blue you see in the figure, uh, consists of electrons. Again, they come from solar winds. They're trapped by the Earth's magnetic field. They're moving faster. And they get trapped, at least the lower end is about 8,100 miles above the Earth. And that 16,000 kilometers you see is about, what, 10,000 miles on average. Okay. So these, these sets of belts are, um, you'll see it any, any celestial body that has a magnetic field. Now, when these particles get, um, enter our atmosphere, then they interact with the atmosphere. Okay. By the way, um, most of these particles, their trajectories are spiral or helical because they have a component of V parallel to Earth's magnetic field and one component perpendicular to Earth's magnetic field. Anyway, those that enter our atmosphere, they usually do so uh, near the poles because the magnetic, f because V and F are perpendicular to each other near the poles, and they enter and they interact with the atmosphere, much like you saw in that tube, and they produce a green light, greenish light. And so the lights uh, that you see are called the northern lights. You, can only, you mainly can see them up in the north or in the south. So the aurora borealis and the aurora australis, they're basically due to a combination of charged particles entering the Earth's uh, field and the interaction of those particles with our magnetic field. If the Earth did not have a magnetic field, those charged particles would reach us. Those charged particles, uh, because of they would be accelerating in our atmosphere, would be giving off radiation, and it would be harmful to us. If you fly in an airplane with a Geiger counter, if you just take a Geiger counter and just fly in an airplane and you compare it to the reading on the ground, you'll notice the difference, that you're, you're, um, you're encountering more radioactivity when you, you, when you are in the air than when you are on the ground. Okay, and let's do these kind of particles. And there's more of those as you go further up. Okay. 
Let's give me a second here. I'm going to change the view. So I want to talk about uh, an, ap an application of um, char charged particles in magnetic fields. And this has to do with something called a Veeam filter. And really, in, in real life, if you want to talk about applications of this idea, um, any, play, any, any system that involves a beam of particles where you have to select those of a certain velocity, um, t uh, you would see this. But it's you know, so a basic application in everyday life, not as common. Okay, like if you were in a lab, you would see the Veeam filter. Okay, or if you were an engineer designing a particular product, you would probably see a Veeam filter. So what is this thing? And it's discussed in your textbook. So let's say I have... Um, a pair of plates. Let's make the top plate positive, the bottom plate negative. And let's bring in a beam of positively charged particles. What would happen if this thing went straight through? It would deflect downwards. It would deflect downwards. Sorry, I missed all the chat stuff. Oh. Yeah, it would deflect downwards. Okay. Suppose I put a magnetic field here. It's uniform. I'm not going to draw the X's. Okay, let's make, so this is a magnetic field into the board. So let's fill this region between the plates with a magnetic field that's into the board. Uh-oh, hold on a second. Okay, my, I'm getting a message that's saying my computer has to restart in five minutes and I can't stop it. So, And I don't have a backup. This is this is ridiculous, but my, my computer is gonna shut me down. Hold on a second. So if that happens, I'm gonna have to uh, figure out a way to get uh, I might be done I might be down for like ten minutes. Okay. Let me, let me check, okay. Well, this is, oh yeah, this is not a Windows computer, by the way, it's a Mac. And I've been trying to find something that's gonna keep this darn thing from updating. Okay. Let's see if I can keep this from happening. I've tried it in the past and I couldn't find it.
I'm going to try one more thing. Hopefully that makes a difference. We'll see. Sorry about that. Hopefully I turn it off, we'll see. Okay, um, I'm just gonna continue until, until it shuts me down if it does. I, I turned off Windows Update, I turned off, not Windows Update, uh, I turned off my updates, so hopefully it won't update. Okay, so anyway, this, the charged particle is gonna go through here. And we know there's an electric field that points downward. And we know there's a magnetic field that points into the board. And the velocity vector points to the right. And we know that the total force on this particle is going to be this. The magnetic field is per perpendicular to V. So sine of theta is 90, I mean sine of, sine of 90 is 1. So I can rewrite it in the following way. Where I get rid of the, arrow, the, the arrows over the, the vector symbols. And so this is the total force on a charged particle. I chose the magnetic field into the board so that the force, if I use the right-hand rule, curl my fingers in the direction of V, point them towards B, the force points upward in the opposite direction of this. So these two are in opposite directions. I can adjust the magnetic field such that these two forces equal, are equal to each other. And so I can set QE equals to QVB, and I get B is E over V, okay? Furthermore, once I know that, then I can solve for V. V is equal to E over B. Slide's That's in the way. I'm sorry? The slide is in the way of that last equation. Oh, okay. Sorry. So, Thank you. so V is just equal to E over B. I can, I can find a magnetic field that will allow this particle to go straight through undeflected. That means I can use the magnetic field to, to choose particles of a, only of a certain velocity they get through. Now you might say, okay, what happens to those particles that don't have the right velocity? What, what are they going to do? They're going to spiral into the plates. They're going to spiral into the plates. But how do I keep only these particles get from getting through and not the other ones? Because, you know, the other ones can spiral into the plates and bounce off, right? How do I keep them from getting through? Well, what I do is I take a plate and I put a hole in it right along the center. I put another plate with a hole in it right along the center. And so only those particles with that velocity, are going to get through the system. Those other ones are just going to be bouncing around inside here. And it's called a velocity selector. Questions on that? The book will call it a velocity selector, selector but it's uh, the... the uh, the person who developed it was named Veen. And that allowed an important experiment to take place. 
The experiment was done by Thompson. Thompson was able to measure the charge to mass ratio of the electron. So what did Thompson do? Well, he was a velocity selector. So he, he set up this tube that you see in the figure. I'll, I'll make the figure bigger. Okay. On the left is what's called a, an electron gun, a device that produces a beam of electrons. It's similar to what's in the oscilloscope. It produces a beam of electrons that you can deflect up and down. And it used to be in the old TV tubes too. And so what he did was he um, set this up and he had the beam go between a pair of plates so he can deflect the beam in the plates. He would adjust the magnetic field and so that the beam came straight through with no deflection. Since he knew the electric field, which is going to be basically the potential difference between those two plates divided by their separation, and he knew the magnetic field, he can calculate the velocity of the electrons. Then he turned off the magnetic field and watched the beam deflect on the screen, the screen was phosphorescent, much like on the oscilloscope you're going to be using. And so you see a blue dot, a bluish tinted dot, not blue, but kind of like a teal colored dot on the screen. And you measure the vertical deflection delta y. Now, using some kinematics that you learned earlier this semester, you can, you can derive an equation for that delta y. And from that equation, he, he knew the dimensions of the plates and the delta y. He was able to determine the charge to mass ratio of the electron, and he got 1.76 times 10 to the 11th coulombs per kilogram. Now, I'm not gonna, I am not assigning this, but for you to practice on, this is the expression for the deflection of the, of the uh, electron in the uh, device. So when he did the experiment, he knew what E was. He knew what X1 was because that's just the dimensions inside the, uh, uh, the cathode ray tube. And he knew what X2 was. And V he measured from the velocity selection. And so all that was left was the ratio Q over M. And he was able to determine that. And this was, you know, over 100 years ago, over 120 years ago. But for you to practice on this material, you probably should try to derive it on your own, the expression for delta Y. So there's your answer. Okay. So... It looks like I, I turned off the update, so it looks like I'm, we're going to be okay. All right. Suppose we have an accelerator. What's an accelerator? It's a device that, and we've talked about this earlier, it's a device in which we accelerate a charged particle through a potential difference. We'll put a hole here and a hole here. We put some, some particle here, some charged particle. And we'll make this zero volts. Or let's do this. Let's make this V naught volts, this zero volts. So the potential difference, delta V, is minus, uh, is, is zero minus V naught. Okay. So these particles go through and I give them kinetic energy. Let's say they're positively charged particles. If they're negatively charged particles, I have to swap these two. And I want to calculate the velocity 
of these charged particles. My change of potential energy is Q delta V. And my delta K is that. Now, V initial is 0. Q delta V is going to be minus Q V naught. So v final, v final is the square root of 2 Q V naught over M. And we've done this in, in, in unit, unit two, okay? So now we have a bunch of particles with velocity given by this expression coming out of here. And then we send them into a magnetic field, okay? So then this goes to a magnetic field. And so what happens when it gets into the magnetic field? The particles going in this direction. Let's, pr pr let's have a magnetic field that points out of the board so that the particles get deflected into a circular path like this. What is the radius of that circular path? Okay, so this is a region. Of uniform field. What is the radius of those particles? Well, since the magnetic field is perpendicular to the velocity vector, we know that Q, V, B, and I'm going to use a script V because otherwise I'm going to confuse it with this capital V. R is going to be what? Uh, MV but V is given by that expression so that gives me the expression for the radius of curvature of the particle that came out of the accelerator. I can solve this for m. Let me let me simplify this first. And let me put the m in here. I want to solve this for m, so I've got to square both sides. So m is given by that. Oops, I made a mistake. Oh, no, we're fine. Did make a mistake. Sorry. Okay, so this is the mass of the particle for a given r. What does that mean? If I put a device here that detects the particles, and it's sensitive enough to measure its position, I can figure out the mass of that particle. Such a device is called a, a mass spectrometer. Have any of you folks had chemistry? Have you talked about the mass spectrometer in chemistry? No? I don't remember. I had a 1A. 1A. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's dis discussed in 2A. I, I, I mean, in 1B, sorry. Um, or in, in, or in the, the organic chem courses. But basically what you can do is you can get a complicated molecule and determine its mass by accelerating, ionizing it, 
You have to ionize it first. Accelerating it through a potential difference. And possibly velocity selecting because you might have other stuff coming out of your accelerator. So you can, you can use a velocity selector in between these and then send them into a magnetic field. And then you determine the radius of curvature of the particle and that will give you M. The detectors are real fancy nowadays. I mean, you can detect the position of the particle very precisely. Okay. So you can get a pretty good value for the mass of the particle. And so that's how you, that, I mean, that's essentially how the mass spectrometer works. I mean, th that's the basic principle. Obviously, there's a lot of details involved uh, to make it work precisely, but that's essentially it. And you do have a couple of questions in the homework regarding the mass spectrometer. This is the big application in science regarding uh, uh, charged particles in the magnetic field. Questions? Another application of the charged particle in the magnetic field is the cyclotron. And the cyclotron was developed by Lawrence and Livingston around 1934. And it was used to produce high energy particles for, um, for nuclear reaction. It's, it's also used um, at some hospitals. Some hospitals actually have a cyclotron to produce isotopes uh, for uh, PET scans, positron emission tomography. And these isotopes aren't, they don't, they're not around very long, like two minute half lives. What they do is they inject, they uh, inject you with a sugar solution. And the sugar solution has the radioactive isotope in there. And they take an image of your brain um, once you've taken this, taken this concoction that has uh, sugar and the radioactive isotope. And they take an image of your brain and they, and they process where, what part of your brain is most active. They know that those active parts mean there's something, something uh, wrong. I mean, they can't do it for all kinds of treatments, but uh, for certain illnesses, they know that they can diagnose things very easily with this uh, method. So what is a cyclotron? Let me check the chat. Um, the reason why there's sugar in the solution is because uh, the sugar will go to the most active part of the brain. And the, and, the, and, and the brain will start processing that. So the cyclotron, I, I got I, I to expand this, it's too small. The cyclotron consists of two parts. They're called Ds. And they're separated by a short distance. And there's a potential difference between the two Ds. So the particle actually starts out in the center. And it starts going in, in a circle. And every time it passes the Ds, it gets accelerated. Because the magnetic field can't change the velocity of the particles, but the, the potential difference between the Ds can. And so, as it goes around and around in a circle, the radius gets bigger, and omega, uh, and omega is constant. Omega is just QB over M. We derived that the other day. Okay, now, in order for... Hold on a second. In order for this to work as the charged particle, every time the charged particle passes this way and then this way, you actually have to reverse the polarity of the Ds, because otherwise it's going to accelerate and decelerate. And so you actually have to do something like this, change the voltage like this fairly quickly, 
Okay, you have to reverse the polarity of the D's, otherwise it ain't gonna work. So that's another consideration. If you're just going this way, you're not changing the polarity, you're gonna go from, high to, from low to high here, and then from high to low here, you're gonna slow down the particle. So you actually have to switch the polarities as this thing goes around and around in circle. Okay. And it's a fairly complex device. Like I said, they, they, they are made commercially for hospitals. All right, so I want to talk now about the force on a current carrying wire in the magnetic field. So let's let's assume for now the mag let's assume for now the magnetic field is uniform. We, so we have this this charged particle in a uniform magnetic field. Can we derive an equation for the force on the wire? Actually, in this case, we can derive one because we just need a little bit of intuition. I mean, let's, let's imagine we have a magnetic field. I don't want to draw all the X's, but I'll draw big X's. And let's draw a wire carrying current this way. The length of wire is L. I want to know uh, what the force is on that wire and the magnetic field is into the board. We know that for a charged particle, B is Q, I'm sorry, F is QV cross B. Okay. But the wire has more than one charge in it. It has many charges. How many, how many charges are in here at any time? How many charges are in this piece of wire at any time? Because I want to know the total charge in the wire. Well, it's going to be uh, the the. the value of each charge times the number of charges per unit volume times this volume. So the total number of charges is this. And so really the total force then is going to be and this V is the drift velocity of the electrons. But what is um, Q times N times A times V sub D? What is that? I had a formula for this. Was this current? This is current. Okay. So we can write this where L is going to give me the direction of, of the, the current, we can write it in the following way. Where L is a vector that goes from this point to this point. Okay, it's really not the length of the wire, but it's a vector so if, if I have a wire like this, and I'll prove it to you in a minute, L is basically the vector that points be between my beginning point and my final point here. 
into the direction of the wire, into the direction of the current. That's L. It doesn't matter whether you use conventional current or electron current because the results are the same. Because a charged particle moving to the left is the same, I mean, a, a negative part particle moving to the left gives you the same result as a positive particle moving to the right. Okay. So if you use conventional current, you're moving, you, you have charged, positively charged particles going. If you're using electron current, then you, you have to think about the fact that you have, uh, this, is, this is opposite and so is this. I is still in the same direction. Okay. And of course, there's a right-hand rule for this. It's a cross product. If the current is in that direction, B is out of the board, point your fingers in the direction of the current. Oh, wait a minute. My hands don't curl that way. I got to flip it over. And curl them towards the magnetic field. So the force on the wire would be downward. So there's our second right-hand rule, but it's really the same as the one for the charged particle in the field. Okay. Is first, as you're drawing on the left, is concerned, would that force be upwards? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that force would be upward. Um, if the magnetic field was not uniform or if the, the current density was not uniform, then uh, this would be a more difficult calculation. We don't do that in this class, but um, if you take this part out, and you just put it on the other side. If your charge, if, you're, if this guy wasn't uniform in the wire, and we're gonna assume in our cases they all are, this is called the, this is called the, uh, the current density. If the current density wasn't uniform, then all you can do is calculate the force on an element of volume of the wire, and then you'd have to integrate over the whole volume. Okay, we don't do those in our, in our class, so we're going to assume J in these problems is uniform. But we can do problems where, v, where B is not uniform. Okay, we can do problems that where B is not uniform. So our expression assumes that the current density is uniform. And the magnetic field is uniform. And we won't encounter one where the current, uh, these kind of problems where the current density is not uniform. Now, what if the current changes directions in the field? Suppose I have a wire set of like that. It's um, it curves like this. Actually, that's a bad. That's a bad, let me let me change my magnetic field because it, it's not going to make a difference in my example. Let's make my magnetic field point upward, like in, this, like in the figure. Okay, so let's let, let, let's let my magnetic field point upward. So this is point A, and this is point B. 
So what if I change in the magnetic field? So this, this angle changes. The direction of F changes. Okay, I mean, for every part of this wire, that direction of F changes. And so what I have to do is calculate really DF. I have to break this wire up into teeny tiny pieces. DS and calculate the force on each DS. And so then my DF But, what does that mean in our case? Hold on a second. What does that mean in our case? I is constant, the magnitude of the current is constant, the magnitude of the field is constant. So I'm just See. integrating, if I want to find F, This is, this is a constant. So this is not part of the integral. I mean, I can pull this out of the integral. Okay, but I gotta be careful with a cross product. If I put this on the other side, I gotta multiply by negative one because cross products don't commute. Okay, so I can pull the I out too. What's the integral of ds? That's what we started with, right? That's our L vector? Yeah, it's your L vector. It's your displacement. Okay, and that kind of proves what I said before, that, you know, that L is the displacement vector. Okay. And so L, then, again, is the vector that points from the beginning point, the beginning of the wire, to the other end of the wire. So L is a displacement vector between points A and B on the wire. So having said that, if I had a loop of wire, a closed loop of wire in a magnetic field, what should the force on it be? Zero. Zero, because the displacement is zero. Okay. That's if the field is uniform. That's not the case if the field is not uniform, okay? That's something you have to remember. So the, the force due to a magnetic field, a uniform magnetic field on a loop of wire is zero. But you know, if I took a bar magnet like this and I had a loop of wire like this and I put the bar magnet like this, the force on that the force on the current carrying wire due to the bar magnet is not going to be zero. Because if I draw a picture, bar magnet has a mag you know, magnetic field that's kind of like this, all, you know, all the way around. If you put a wire around this thing, okay, this magnetic field has a component upward and a component in the radial direction. The upward component of the magnetic field around the loop is going to cancel. I mean, the force due to the upward component is going to cancel out. But the force due to this component is not because it constantly changes directions. And so this component is going to contribute to the total force on that wire, but not the vertical component. And as long as the magnitude of this thing is constant, it's easy to calculate that force. And there's a problem in your book that discusses this. I, I forget what problem number it is. But that's a, it's a good one to take a look at. 
So I want to do a calculation for a, the force on a wire in a magnetic field. I'm going to do this two different ways. I'm going to do it the easy way, and I'm going to do, well, actually, I'm going to do it the hard way, and then I'm going to do it the easy way. The reason why I'm going to do it both ways is so that you, you learn how to calculate the force on a loop of wire in a non-uniform field. Because this method applies for calculating the force in the non-uniform field because you have a worksheet that you have to do. Okay, and so this is going to help you with that calculation. Although the, the worksheet calculation is actually easier than this one. But I'm just giving you, the worksheet, I'm just giving you practice for doing this calculation because I couldn't find a problem in, in the textbook like this. Okay, so I have a um, semicircular wire. Like this. Um, and it's carrying current counterclockwise. Okay. And the current's five amps. And the radius is 0.25 meters. And we have a magnetic field into the board. And it's 1.8 Tesla. Oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's out of the board, sorry. So my coordinate system looks like this. And maybe I should draw it on top of here. I want to calculate the force in this wire. from this whole wire, okay? So I'm going to use the idea that DF is I DS cross B. Because the angle, well, because this thing changes directions. But also, I mean, I don't have to do it this way. I mean, I'm just showing you how to do it this way because it basically shows you how to set up the integral. I want to break up this wire into a DS. A DS. The magnitude of DS is what? Well, this is an arc length. How do you how do you write an arc length? R D theta. R D theta. Now the direction of the current is going to be the direction of this ds. So the current direction is, I guess I'll use blue, that way. This angle is theta. Let me draw another coordinate system up here. So if this is theta, this is theta, this is 90 minus theta. So isn't the unit vector for ds the unit vector has a negative x component And 
and a positive y component So, the to so this is the unit vector, this is the magnitude. So this is what ds is. Can I rewrite that? Yeah, because cosine of 90 minus theta, is it, isn't it the same as the sine of theta? And so... Then my df is i times that thing and then crossed with the magnetic field. What is that going to give me? What's I minus I cross K? In other words, what is this? cross with this. That's in the minus j direction. What is j cross k? What is j cross k? So j is this way. K is this way, J cross K is I in the I hat direction. So that's my DF. I want F. So F is going to be the integral of this. What are my limits of integration? Zero to pi. And there's all those constants. What is the integral of sine of theta? Isn't that, cos isn't that minus the cosine of theta? Does that look okay so far? I, I wonder if I made a mistake. Let me check my notes. I'm worried about a sign here. Yeah, I did make a sign here. Because when I did I cross K's, and it was in a minus J direction. So that makes this a minus. So what is this? What does this give you? What sign of pi? Zero. What sign of zero? zero. 
And so th then what is this term going to give you? Is this going to give you a, a 2? And so what do I get? I get 2 times 5 amps times 0.25 meters times 1.8 Tesla in the j-hat direction. And that gives me a value of 4.5 j-newtons. I did this the hard way, but this, I'm hoping this helps you do that worksheet. Because you, you need to know how to uh, set up the integrals. What if I do it this way? What's my L vector if I just do it this way? It's my displacement from here to here, right? The current's five amps. L is minus two times 0.25 I hat cross 1.8 Tesla K hat. And they erased it, but minus I cross K is hold on a second, I made a mistake somewhere. Oh yeah, this is in the k hat direction, uh, in the j in the j hat direction. I get the same result. Is there a question on, any questions on it? Do you believe that if I put a wire in a magnetic field, it'll experience a force? Maybe I should demonstrate that to you. So, I'm getting a big magnet. And again, I'm going to point this down. So I have a big magnet, and I have a bunch of other magnets attached to it. You can tell it's a strong magnet. And I'm getting a big power supply. By the way, this is the power supply you guys will be using to test your uh, motors. Okay, I'm going to put... This is, not, this is usually not the power supply I use. I, I couldn't find the one I usually use. This was a much bigger power supply, so I'm worried. Okay, fairly long. And I'm going to put this loop of wire in a magnetic field. I 
I can see if I can just do it with the one. This piece is too small. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna have to turn the power on real quick. I have it backwards, hold on a second. There we go. Did you guys see the, the uh, wire jump out of the magnet? One more time. Okay, so you get to see the demonstration of a force on a wire in a magnetic field. I had to run a pretty big current, though, to get this to, get this to work. Okay. All right, any questions? All right. Uh, just a clarification. Uh, this isn't magic, right? No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> if you want to, I can, I can set it up here. You can... You can check it out. Although I, I worry about this power supply. It's it's a little that one went up to like eight amps. My other one doesn't go up that high. So I wanna do oops. One more question. So you see that drum again, uh, I'll make this bigger. You see that drawing. The question is, um, indicate the north and the south poles of that horseshoe magnet. It's a conceptual question. Okay. So I'm going to draw the picture on the board. I have magnet like this and a wire carrying current like so. And the force on it is upward. So what I would do is I'm going to have to use the right hand rule. I'm going to have to kind of use it backwards. So I'm going to draw a coordinate system like this. I'm going to say my current's this way. My F is this way. Which way should the magnetic field point? Well, it's, it's got to be either to the left or to the right. So if I choose B this way, and I do I cross B, right? I L cross B. Put my fingers in the direction of I, curl them towards B, it points downward. So the field can't point that way. The field must point this way. If I do that, point my fingers in the direction of I into the board, curl them towards B, my thumb points upward. So B points in that direction. And so the magnetic field always points from the North Pole to the South Pole. So that means that this is the North Pole and this is the South Pole. Okay. All right, so on Wednesday, I'm going to say a few more things. I'm, on Wednesday, I'm going to talk about, um, I'll have a, a couple of demonstrations. I'll talk about the torque on a loop of wire 
in the magnetic field. And then I'll briefly talk about the Hall effect. And I'll be done with the chapter, and I will start on chapter 30. Okay. And on Friday, we'll talk about the scope quiz. So um, download the scope quiz, read that manual, look at the videos. Okay, and we'll talk about the scope quiz on Friday. You have the option on coming in Wednesday or Thursday and playing with our oscilloscopes. It'll be pretty much like, uh, this thing is heavy, pretty much like this guy. So you just have to know how the dials work and how to make a simple measurement. Okay, and um, if you're here and I'm around, I can I can help you. Okay, and Friday I might... is on campus. I'm sorry. We're coming in on Friday, right? We're, yeah, from now on, every Friday you're coming. Okay. It's in person. And then um, the lab is open for you guys the other day, so you can, if you want, take the mul take the quiz on Friday. You can. Uh, Listen to my lecture, and then play with the, practice with the uh, oscilloscope, and then take the quiz, and you're done. Okay? But then you have, but you also have Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of next week to try it, too. Okay? Thursday the 10th is a holiday. And then the following Friday, so we'll be closed on that Thursday. The following Friday, then, on, on the 12th, I'm sorry, the 11th, we're off. On the 12th, I'm going to start the new lab. And we, we, I'm going to give you guys two weeks for that lab just because we're a little bit ahead of, in the lecture. I mean, the lab. We're, we're further ahead in the lab than we are in the lecture. So, Other questions? Okay, I guess I'll stop here. I'll see yeah, you on Wednesday. You.